I'd like to preach a message tonight called How to Daily Torture Yourself. All right? Just, uh, it's, that's the name of the message. You'll understand perfectly by the end of it. How to daily torture yourself. You know, some of you look at me like that's a strange thing, but we're going to look at the life of a man, a believer in Jesus Christ, a believer in the Messiah, who daily, the Bible records, tortured himself spiritually with this matter of retaining sin in his life as a Christian, as a believer. We are in the middle of the sin series. I hate that title, but it, it just describes what we're doing. We are, we are looking at New Testament passages. Please understand, so everybody can be on the same track here. I want everybody to get it. We have some visitors and some new, new folks. I want, to, I want you to understand where we started with this thing. You have made per, been made perfectly righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. We just saw those things tonight. You have standing with God. You have immediate fellowship with God. When you sin, there is no chance that you are going to be thrown into the pit of hell. There is no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus. We saw clearly from the word of God that our sin uh, clouds fellowship, that our, it, it withholds blessing. However, it does not make, mean God is mad at you. It, he is, does not have a grudge against you. Uh, any more that when my children do wrong against me, that somehow I hate them or I have a grudge against them. Every loving fa uh, parent in this room, when their children has done something wrong and come into their presence, there's immediate acceptance, immediate forgiveness, and there's immediate retention, there's immediate love, and they're still, and they always have been, their children, they're, and they're their loving father, their loving mother. But somehow when we come to God and we get this view sometimes that when Christians sin, that somehow he, we're far from him, that's just not true. The blood of Jesus Christ makes us nigh unto God, the scripture says. So while we're talking about dealing with the sin series of sin in a Christian's life, we're talking about the Bible says that we are to live what he has made us. He has made us holy and righteous. We are to live that. Not because he holds some bullwhip over us and beats us. We're gonna, in a coming uh, Sunday night, we're going to see that in the book of Galatians. A major failure in the church of Galatia, thinking that somehow they had to, they had to keep God's pleasure by living righteously. It was a failure in their part. Not because he holds a bullwhip or a hammer over you, or some grudge that if you mess up, that he's immediately going to hate you or, or hold a grudge against you or throw, push you away. Not because of that, but the Bible says that love compels us to serve him and to live holy. That we want to because that's what he has made us. And that is a wonderful, joyous motivation for the believer's life. It is the biblical motivation. There are passage after passage after passage in the New Testament that compels a believer to come away from sin. None of it with the threat of being thrown out of God's presence. None of it with the threat of God beating on you in hate in some way. He will chasten you because he loves you just like Jerry spanks his kids in the missions house. All right, in the haven of rest, just like that. I think you love him, don't you? Yeah, yeah, you love him. Amen. All right. But tonight, uh, we have up to this point looked at, at sections of the New Testament and uh, to, to show very clearly from the New Testament of, of many passages that compel, that are preaching against sin that are for Christians, not for the unsaved to be saved, although they need to be also. And tonight we continue with our sin series in 2 Peter chapter 2 in verse number 6 by looking at an Old Testament example, or excuse me, a New Testament example of an Old Testament believer who failed to flee sin. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 6, please stand loving and respecting the word of God. The example that the scripture gave us when there was public reading, the people stood. I like it. We're jumping right into the thinking of chapter 2. Look up here and I'll jump right into it. And here's the thinking. It's God's talking about terrible damnation that's going to come against the unsaved. And he's talking about it's certainly going to come. It's definitely going to come. Some of the allusions here are to the tribulation we preached about this morning. But right in the middle of it, in verse number 6, you see an allusion to someone who was saved. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and condemned them with an overflow, making them an example and sample uh, unto those that after should live ungodly. That is, that they're going to be judged. That was the example, the ensample. Verse number 7, and delivered just Lot. Now that's odd. The word just before Lot's name, if you never read that in the New Testament, you may not guess it about the old. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. 
For that righteous man dwelling among them, it, that's wicked people, sinful people, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Father, we ask you one more time this day that you would open up the precious word of God, unpack it for the people. You do your precious work. We give you the glory. Change our lives. Let the word of God change us. It is good. Your, your ways are the best ways. And I praise you, dear Lord, and I exalt Jesus Christ, your Savior. Thank you. I pray work now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We jump in the middle of chapter 2 thinking, and we see this guy named Lot. He was saved from the damnation of Sodom, according to chapter 2, the beginning part. The Bible says that he was just. You've got to understand what that means. That is the same word as the word justified in the New Testament. He was justified Lot. As an Old Testament believer, that means that his faith, faith was on the grace that would come from God, not his own righteousness. He was not looking for his own righteousness to save him. Obviously, he lived in Sodom, okay? He was trusting in the faith of the coming Savior. And we know that that was Jesus Christ. He was just. He was a believer that lived in the middle of ungodliness. Look at verse number 7. It's very interesting. It says, and delivered, that is God delivered just Lot, vexed. Here's Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. That is that he was vexed with their filthy lifestyle, the conversation of sinful people all around him. He was living around that lifestyle. And that word vexed means, that first word in verse 7 means, it weared him down. You ever been weared war, whatever the right word is, down by the unrighteousness all around you? As you work in the world, as you're, you live there on your street or in your subdivision, as all around you there is, is sin and you go to the mall and you feel dirty. You need one of those uh, Jesus washing Peter's feet when you get home from the mall because things are so filthy and things are so unrighteous and immoral. Well, here's Lot. It wore him down every day. The idea there is it's someone who had spent all their energy. They were just, he was wearing down as he lived there day after day after day. Most of you know what it's like to be around the sinfulness of the world and feel like you're pulled down spiritually. You feel like you're dirty just being around and disturbed and bothered. But verse number 8 gives, goes a step more. It explains it even more. It, it, look at verse number 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. It calls Lot here a righteous man. And you notice the second time it says he vexed his righteous soul day to day with their unlawful deeds. I want to put a challenge out to you. Those of you who are study of, studiers of the word of God, I want you to look up both of these words vexed. Because the word vexed in verse number 7 is not the word translated vexed in verse number 8. They are completely different words in our Bible. In our English translation, they're the same words. The first word means to wear down, but the second word means to torture. He tortured himself day by day by staying in the middle of their ungodliness and their wicked deeds. He tortured his soul daily with their unlawful deeds. Being around sin wore him down first, but then it tortured him as he did not make a change in his life. Christian, you can sin the same sin as the unsaved around you, but you'll never be like them because you have a soul that like like Lot has been made righteous and just. It will never please you. It will never satisfy you. You'll never be able to get your kicks off of living a life of sin. It will torture your soul. Right. Your righteous soul. There's a spirit of God who has made you a new person. And all that you want to, you can't go back to that place. You just can't go back to Egypt. Your righteous soul, because salvation is eternal, you will never be comfortable there again. And that's a great thing. It will wear you down first. And if you remain in, around, and with that sinfulness, it'll torture you day by day. It may seem to you that Lot is a martyr here. If you look at these verses, it kind of it kind of presents it almost as a passive idea that there was poor Lot. And boy, he was vexed. And it was a terrible thing. But if you look closer, you may be tempted to pity him. But you'll notice that it was a voluntary decision. This guy was not in bondage in Sodom. They never found him when the angels came locked up. That he was, you know, he couldn't get out. It wasn't like that at all. 
may seem to you that Lot was a martyr. You may be tempted to pity him, but he made the decision that many believers, and maybe some here tonight, and frankly some here tonight, make. And that that they are going to voluntarily stay in the middle of sin, with sin all around them, even participating in it, tolerating it in their life, maybe small things, maybe great things, and they are vexing themselves every day. You're torturing yourself every day in your inner man, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. And every Christian in here knows what I'm talking about when they tolerate and they allow sin on a daily basis, anger, bitterness, impurity, whatever it is. You understand what it's like to torture yourself because there's a righteous man within you, in your soul, that God put there by the Holy Spirit, and you're torturing him when you remain around sin. You allow it all around you. It says, verse number 8, it was a voluntary decision. It says dwelling among them. Nobody made him stay there. There were no chains on him. He was not a prisoner. He dwelt there by choice. And in a moment we're going to see he went there by choice. Total choice. Verse number 8 says in seeing and hearing. You know it's a strange thing but I am pretty sure that Lot's eyes blinked. I'm pretty sure that he didn't have to look on the sin he did not have to hear and listen to the jokes and to the impurity. You talk about a wicked place. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the comparison of Sodom and Gomorrah in America are. Maybe they're pretty even right now. I don't know. But it was a nasty, wicked place all around him. And there he sat. There he saw. He looked with his eyes. He listened with his ears. He put himself in that position voluntarily. You'll notice in verse number 8 that he vexed his righteous soul. As you look at the parts of speech and you look at here of what, you know, where, is this a passive idea that he was vexed? No. It gives the idea that the righteous man, he is the one who tortured himself daily. He is the one who put himself in that voluntary position day by day. He tortured his soul, literally, day by day. Yeah, this is no different than the Christian that chooses to remain in sin and God has told him to come away from it. God has told him to fight it with everything of his being. God has told him to flee fornication, flee youthful lust. God has told us to be holy, to be innocent concerning that which is evil. I could quote and quote, could keep on telling you verse after verse after verse. He says, come away with it. You're not that way anymore. Do everything in your power to come away with it. Live holy, for I'm holy. Be holy, for I'm holy. Much of the time, the torturing of our own inner man with sin is a result of the choices that we make to be around sin and the refusal to cut off the ties to sin. God never intended for us to live that way. If we really wanted to, like Lot, we could move away from the sinful environment that we put ourselves in, but that choice would be too hard for us to make. Frankly, sometimes we would rather just torture ourselves, enjoy the pleasures of sin. And I'd like to show you how Lot took the road to torture himself. Turn over to Genesis chapter th 13. Genesis chapter 13. I want to show you how to torture yourself daily, just like Lot, how he got himself into that position. In Genesis chapter 13, I will admit to you tonight that there has been sin that has tortured me for months in my inner man and I refused to obey God and amputate it. I knew it was there. I ignored it. I refused to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And you, you're in the same boat, so don't look at me all spiritual. We just, uh, we just need to learn. We need to sanctify. We need to learn. You need a good we need a good message about why that torture comes in our life. If you look at verse number 1 through 13, I will read this to you in Genesis 13. And Abraham... Went, out, went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that they had, and lot with him into the south. And Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. And he went on his journeys from south even to Bethel, under the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and, and Hai, Hai, excuse me, under the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. The Bible calls him in another place the friend of the Lord, the Lord's friend. The lot, uh, and Lot also, which went with Abraham, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abraham said unto Lot, unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between uh, my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, uh, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plains of Jordan. That it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, 
That garden of the Lord, of course, was Eden, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Lot was Abraham's nephew, and God had blessed them both tremendously. You have the idea here in the picture in the previous chapters that their, their riches, riches increased incrementally. God was just blessing. They were headed through Canaan. It was God's promised land. Everything was great, and they were being blessed for it. You see Abraham especially worshiping for the Lord. There was great fellowship. All was great. It was a mighty time, a wonderful time. And as their possessions multiplied, though, the Bible says that the servants began fighting. Uh, these two men agreed that it was best to part company. No problem yet. They were on, in God's promised Canaan. That is the north side of the Red Sea. Backwards, sorry. They're on the north side of the Red Sea. The northwest side. And Abraham gave Lot the option of which direction he wanted for his land. And here's we, here, here is where we come to the first road sign that where he decided, he made decisions that ended up him vexing, torturing his soul on a daily basis. Number one, and this is directly applicable to our lives tonight, Lot began making decisions based on selfishness. Based on selfishness. And that's the starting place for you to torture your soul with allowing sin to stay in your life that God never intended. He began making the decisions based on selfishness. Look at verse number 10. He lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan. It was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like in the land of Egypt. You got to get the picture here. Abraham says, left, right, whatever you want, you can have it. So he looks up, and the decision that he's made is made just on what he himself sees and wants. Christian, when you begin making decisions in your life, and even on a daily basis, just based on yourself, you're headed for this place of daily torture. He looks at it. Abraham was selfless in giving Lot the decision. But the Bible says that the reason that Lot chose what he chose was based on him lifting up his what? Yell it out. Eyes. It was he made this decision of where he went just based on the pleasure of what he saw in his eyes. Now let me ask you a question. Is that a good thing to make a, a life decision on? Just on what looks good? No. No. But how often is the, that the basis of how you and I decide he saw the plain of Jordan, lush and watered everywhere. It was like the Garden of Eden. It was like Egypt at that time, a very rich place. It, it was desires to live in. It would bring him great wealth and, and for all functional purposes. I mean, I looked up at the rainfall was great in that plain of Jordan. I mean, it was, everything was so desirous. It was a great place. And surely he would increase even more. And he says, it's wonderful. That's where I'll go. That's what I want. Folks, Slot's decision was made on the lust of his eyes. There were some obvious things as you think over this that were missing from his choice. Number one, what did God want? Uh, did, did I miss something in my reading here? I see Abraham getting before God at the altar and talking with altar. I see Lot nowhere to be found before God, never asking God left or right. God, what would you have me, where would you have me go left or right? How often our decisions are made from our gut and from just our desires and what we think will prosper us the most instead of what does God want? Based on the word of God, they had direct uh, access to God at this time. No doubt, Lot had worshipped in Abraham's presence. He was a, Abraham was a friend of God that walked with God. He, could, he had the ability to call out on the name of the Lord just like Abraham did. But we see a great from Lot. Did you hear that? Neither did I. We hear a great nothing. Lot doesn't call out. Lot doesn't desire in all his ways to acknowledge him so God would direct his paths. He just looks at the decision, shoots from the gut. This is what I'd like. This is what I want. You want to come to the place of eventually torturing yourself, folks, and your family in sin and be vexed with sin on a daily basis, then begin making the choices of what your flesh wants without consulting God. Just, make, just do what you'd like to do. It'll be all right. You'll end up right where Lot does. <laughs> Vexing your righteous soul day by day. Do what your gut feels. Do what your eyes desire. Do what feels right. Just do what you want to do. What will make you happy? You will be on the sure course of vexing, of torture. There's another missing factor in this. 
What would be best for his family according to God? There was no question on that. The Bible is very clear in these two verses. He lifted to, he, Lot, this was a solo decision. You know, he lifts up his eyes and he just says, hey, this is going to be what's greatest for me, me, my, me. What would be best for his family according to God? Many people like Lot would reason that it was best for his family to move them to a place where he would have the most possessions. That's really what we're dealing with here. Lot's lust of his eyes were that he would go to the place that he would become rich, 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 and more wealthy and more wealthy. Hold on a minute. Who had given him his wealth in the first place? It was God directly. We see that directly in the chapter. But his idea was, this is what is best for my family. Listen, believer, never make a decision for your family about what's best for them based on how much money you're going to make or how good the certain uh, things are going to be about a job or, or, or what looks best about a house or, or what's greatest and how many options the car has, okay, that you're going to buy. Listen, what's God want? What's best for your family according to what God says, the real factors? They were literally moving away from God's land of blessing. I mean, that's Canaan. That's what it is, God's land of blessing. They were moving towards cities that were godless and pagan. Their children uh, would have only godless friends to play with. Their family would be greatly influenced by sinful cultures. And this is, this is what Lot guessed, what he thought was best. What's best for my family? We'll be extremely rich because the plain of Jordan will yield us all kinds of herds of cattle and flocks. What a silly way to make a decision. The choices of priority and lifestyle and time and finances and family must not be selfish Lot choices. They must be, what does God want? What would be biblically best for me and for my family? What does God say would be biblically best? A hobby, a career, a habit that takes you constantly from the Lord or from your family or from your church or from your ministry in that church is not God's best for your life. It's just not. Why? Because God's word says what is best for our lives. It is the warning on the path of torture when you begin making decisions based on yourself on what you want or what will prosper you the most. It is also interesting here that though Lot had become wealthy, think about it, how did he become wealthy? This guy named Abraham. He had become wealthy on the heels of Abraham. We see nowhere in these verses where he says, I think I'll let Abraham choose instead of me. There's no thought to Abraham at all. His decisions were only made to prosper one person. And his name has three letters and begins with an L and ends with a T. And there's an O dear in the middle. It was only based on prospering Lot. He made a choice based on what he wanted. There's a second way to torture yourself, and the road goes on to this land of called vexing or torturing your righteous soul on a daily basis. And that is, you'll notice that Lot allowed the interest of wickedness in his righteous life. He noticed he allowed himself to have an interest in wickedness. Look at verse number 12 and 13. Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, but Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent toward Sodom. And the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord. See, I, I know what it's like to spiritualize a text. That is that you take a handy-dandy phrase out of the text and you like twist it as a preacher to make a spiritual meeting and everybody cries, okay? When you look at verse number uh, 11, or excuse me, verse number 12, and you see the last phrase, and pitched his tent toward Sodom, God is making a point here of the direction of Lot's life, not the longitude and latitude of his tent. You understand what I'm saying here? When it says he pitched his tent toward Sodom, it is revealing his heart, his feet, his direction. He was looking with an interest towards Sodom. For all we know, the crack in the front of his tent, I think they had Coleman tents back then. For all we know, the entrance of his tent entered to the plain of Jordan that headed towards Sodom. I don't know. But this is making a point. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. He had an interest. He allowed an entrance in sinfulness, though he was a just man. And he worshipped Jehovah only and trusted in the grace of Jehovah to save him from his sins. He pitched his tent that way. He didn't move to Sodom at the beginning. He only allowed himself to observe it, to think about it, to become enamored with it. He just stared at it a little bit. Listen to me, believer. Are you staring at sin in your life in some area? Oh, you're not, you're not plunged into it. I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, you can never be associated with it yet. You can't be identified with it yet. But you're, put, you're pitching your tent towards it. 
You're allowing yourself to stare at it. You are becoming interested in it. The Bible says we are to be innocent concerning evil. Don't torture yourself with all the knowledge of the sinful crowd. Don't even stare at that crowd. Don't, you know, if you stare at the, you even stare at the, I know some Christians, and this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. People uh, say, come to me and they say, if you do this, for, forgive me, I'm, I'm just talking about you. But uh, they come to me and they say, oh, how bad this is. And they can recite 80,000 things about a, a wicked situation or a movie star or a show or something like that or something at the mall. And they can tell you every detail about it. And they say, isn't that terribly bad? And I say to them, why are you staring at it? I don't say that because I don't want them to be mad at me. But the truth is, why do we allow ourselves to become enamored with wickedness at all? Why don't we just get away from it? you got enough family and enough ministry and enough activity here with the youth group and children's groups or whatever to keep you in a holy and a righteous environment for the rest of your life if God would allow it. You know, why do we mix ourselves with the world? Why do we do that? Well, he allowed this interest in wickedness. He didn't move to Sodom at first. He just pitched his tent that way. This is the downfall of the vexing of many believers' lives. We tolerate an interest in our flesh. The Bible has a specific verse on it in Romans 13, 40, 14. It says, and put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for, for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The little phrase, make not provision for the flesh. That phrase doesn't mean don't plunge into fleshliness. It means don't even provide for an interest in that in a, at a later time. Don't put things in a backpack that you might enjoy later making provision for the flesh. Don't make, don't have any interest in fleshliness. Don't stare at it at all. Instead of fleeing sin, as the Bible says, we allow worldliness and sin to remain just at a hand's length away. Just, it's just there. You know, we're not involved in it, but it's just right there if we need it, <laughs> if we want to grab it. We are not fully involved in the things. We just dabble in them. We stare at a lot. A former pastor of mine, you say that it's kind of like a pet that you have, just a little teeny wee pet, and you keep him away in a, in a, in a closet most of the time. But sometimes you, you take him out when nobody else is around or, or, or you know, at a, you know, a time. You keep him available and you take him out and you, you play with him and you have him there, that pet of sin, and then you put him away again. But he is pr the provision is there. And there's Lot staring at the sin. It's available to him. He's not pitching his tent away from Sodom. He's pitching his tent towards Sodom. I ask you, do you think, do you think that God intended for us to keep sin around in our life to vex our, to vex our righteous soul? Do you really think that God was pleased with Lot's vexing his righteous soul? No, nor is he pleased with us, nor is it his intention to us to live other than a transparent life of joy. We're not to keep around the pets of sin. We're not to keep around at hand's length anywhere. Kill that pet. Amen. That's a good thing to say. <laughs> Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. A fellow called me who professed to be a believer one day in the office. This was a couple months ago. And he, he, was, he was saved. I believe that he probably was saved. I, I can't say that. I don't know. God knows. But the fact is that alcohol had destroyed his life and was destroying his life presently. And as we talk, we talk for a long time. And I try and encourage him. He made a decision right there on the, uh, on the phone to, to give up his backslidden ways to live for God. And, and he said that he was going to come. I think he believed, believed he said he was going to come to this church. I don't think he ever did or whatever. And uh, as I talked on, he was sitting there, I believe, at a table with a bottle of alcohol at the table. And so I asked him, do you have alcohol right there in your house right now? He says, yes, I do. I said, is it destroying your life? Yes. I, do you, are you a Christian? Do you, do you know Christ your Savior? Yes, I do. Do you believe God wants you? No, he hates that stuff. He hates, I said, then pick up the bottle right now, walk to the sink and pour it down. Silence. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to do that. I, I'm not ready for that yet. And how often is that the answer, not of the unsaved, but even the believer. I'm not ready to give up my sin yet. I want to hold on. I want to keep that around at arm's length. Why? To vex your soul, to torture your soul. How many of you tonight have bridges and interests and in sinful things that you allow in your life that you really need to radically amputate? They're, con they're not consuming you, but you do pitch your tent towards them. You do stare at them. You do have them around and dabble in them, friendships or habits or reading material or media or partying or drinking or organizations that are affecting you in an ungodly way or whatever. I can't hit yours. You know it. The Spirit of God is dealing with you tonight about it. Where you point your feet is where you're going to eventually go. 
That's, that's, isn't that a profound thought? <laughs> Unless you walk backwards. You see that in Lot. Now listen to me. This thing's going to all come together pretty quick. In Genesis 14, verse number 12, we see that his tent was no longer pitched toward Sodom. We, know, we see in Genesis 14, at verse number 12, that he moved right into the city. There's a whole other story there that it's a wicked story, but Lot was living in the city. Gone from the tent, he is in a house in the city. And then we take a, a step farther. Genesis 14, 12 says, who dwelt in Sodom. That's Lot dwelling in Sodom. Turn over to chapter 19 and verse number 1. I want to read you one verse. The Bible takes a step farther. You see Lot going even farther into this torturous life. In verse number 1, it says, And there came two angels at Sodom, uh, to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. What is, for those of you who know your Hebrew history, you know what, the, what, the, what that means. The gate was a place of judgment and a place of ruling. It was a place where leaders made decisions. Lot was some kind of magistrate or had some kind of position there. When, when you sat at the gate, you were ruling like Moses and those men that he had appointed to rule. There was a reason. You see these two angels. He was at the gate, the place of leadership. That's the last step there to torturing your righteous soul as a Christian. You can see him move from the tent. It's pitched that way. You can see him having an, allowing an interest. There is Sodom. He doesn't move his tent from it. He's looking at it. He becomes enamored with it. He decides to go closer, closer, closer. Soon he's living inside the city. Soon he's at the gate. Part of the decision-making process of this terrible, wicked place, Sodom. And that's the last step here tonight I want to share with you of torturing your righteous soul as a Christian. Lot accepted compromises of evil to satisfy a fleshly longing of his life. These were steps of compromise. Steps of giving in a little and a little and a little more towards worldliness and towards sin that God never intended for a Christian. You know, Satan never tempts us to leap a huge amount, does he? He just brings a little temptation. He allows us to tolerate a little more. In the process of five and ten years, some believers have gone, have gone from conservative godliness and holiness, as the New Testament teaches, to a place that they're right in the world. And they wonder how they got there. They wake up one day, sitting in a preaching service just like that, and they say, how did I get here? Just like Lot did. You see here that he made this decision. He was sitting in the gate because at some point he made the decision that he was going to compromise, not being a part of what was going on in Sodom, so that he could have some prideful position and status. He made a decision for the flesh, for the pride. Why? You know, maybe he justified it. It's not hard to figure out how he would justify it. Maybe I can change things around here. Boy, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? I want to become part of the sinful system. I want to get involved in the wickedness so I can change it. That's not what God intended at all. And you can see that obviously when he rained down fire. <laughs> okay? He made this decision of compromise. He had once dwelt and worshipped with Abraham, the friend of God. In chapter 11, the wickedness of Sodom had been so clear to him. It said very clearly as he chose this way, the people were wicked. But now he was right in the middle of the wickedness. He even compromised to the place of being associated with the government of that wicked place. He compromised godliness for status. Let me ask you, believer, have you compromised your holy living over the years to adjust to something that you just really wanted or wanted for your family or you just wanted to participate in? It's not God's way. It's not God's way. Believer, Lot didn't have to do this. He did not have to accept this career. Let's call it that. Lot, why did they separate in the first place? Because both of them were wealthy man with, men with great position. God had blessed Lot when he was a conservative, godly, messianic believer. He had blessed him greatly when he was obeying, when he was leaving it up to the Lord, and the Lord was taking care of providing for him. Then he, his substance multiplied. But when he took it upon himself, and all of a sudden you see him making decisions and compromises, and he ends up in, in some status career or what, as a magistrate of Sodom or whatever he was, and all of a sudden God's blessing doesn't come anymore, it's God's curse. He didn't have to take that position, but he compromised for the fun and the popularity and the status that stroked the flesh. Hear the word of the Lord tonight. Lot was really someone after he compromised what he knew 
was right in order so that he could flee, feed his flesh. He was really someone, and I'm going to tell you what he was. He was a war down, tortured believer. That's where he ended up. A war down, tortured believer. The Bible says it wasn't some of the time. It was day by day, if you remember the scripture in 2 Peter. He was tortured within his righteous soul because he knew that that was no place for a Christian. The middle of wickedness is no place for a child of God. It's just not. Don't make decisions based on selfishness. Don't allow yourself to stare at the sin of the world. Have no interest in that. Cut yourself off from that. You say, I really like some of those things. I enjoy participating in some of those things. So do I. But the problem is God doesn't want that for me. And that's not the best. It's not the best thing, child of God. And don't compromise what you know is right for stroking your flesh in pleasure and opportunity or promotion or status or all the beautiful plains. Jordan, would you bow your heads tonight?